atomic theory goes back to Dem Dem Democritus or Democritus. But there's, so, but there's these arguments in more advanced physics that, that say that maybe there's a problem with continuity or real numbers, and especially with very, very, very small distances where you get infinities, you get divergences. And there's also renormalization is a, an issue connected with this for those of you who, who, who know some of the lingo from, uh, from uh, high energy particle physics. Okay, renormalization. But anyway, I like to go, so partly inspired by this, there are a whole bunch of neo-Pythagoreans, and let me mention some names, uh, who, who've been thinking in new directions. And uh, the, the best name for these new directions, I think, comes from uh, Edward Fredkin, that I happen to know for many years. He likes to call this digital philosophy or digital physics, this whole new viewpoint. Now, another name which is connected with this is cellular automata. But cellular automata is only one possible one possible implementation of this idea, this neo-Pythagorean idea of digital physics and digital philosophy. And let me mention some other names. There's Stephen Wolfram, who has this enormous book, A New Kind of Science, which has attracted a lot of attention, mostly negative. I happen to think it's an interesting book. But I think it's a philosophy book, not a physics book, the way Wolf Stephen might think it is. John Wheeler has talked about it from bit. Wheeler's an old guy who worked with Niels Bohr. He's at Princeton retired. And it from bit is a slogan that Wheeler has come up with, which really means matter from information, from zeros and ones. And this is a provocative sermon, because Wheeler, now in his old age, is going around giving sermons. You may say, I'm going to giving a sermon also. But um, so, so another name is Seth Lloyd is a name. Uh, there was Konrad Zuse, one of the inventors of the computer. He did it, actually, uh, on Nazi Germany under wartime conditions. Fortunately, they didn't actually build a useful one. He came up with something called crystalline space, which is the idea of cellular automata as a possible physics. And uh, Tom Toffoli is another person. Now, what kind of work are they doing? Well, the idea is it's a physics in which everything is discrete, including space-time. You know, you divide it up into a, a lattice. And every one of these squares has only a finite number of states, maybe 0 and 1 if you want, but it can be finite but larger. And, and you have some rule that says how the future state of each square depends on its previous state and the state of its neighbors. And these are very simple toy universes. Now, the extremists, like Edward Fredkin, think this might give a physics for this physical universe done this way. I have some doubts about cellular automata. For example, it's very difficult to have moving bodies. Because if you try to move a whole region at the same time, it's very hard. But I think that, um, that this, you know, so Wolfram talks about uh, space-time networks, causal networks. He discusses cellular automata a lot, but he also talks about other things. But anyway, what I think is interesting here is that even if this is not a toy model of our universe, there are interesting toy models of possible universes that might be of some interest. And one of the most interesting pieces of work was done by Ed Fredkin, uh, Norman Margulis, Tom Toffoli, having to do with reversible automata. You see, uh, Fredkin looked at only one piece of physics, which is reversibility. And if you look at microscopic classical physics, it's time reversible. And, and, and there should be no loss of information. Entropy should be conserved. Uh, in other words, if you run a film of a gas, if you, have a, you know, if you have a gas, normally, macroscopically, you can determine the direction of time. Right? If you, if you have a movie of, a, of, a, of taking a, 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 a glass, made of glass, and you throw it in the air, and it crashes into the ground and breaks in bits, if you run this movie backwards and all the pieces reassemble themselves into a glass with water that you drink, you know the film is being run backwards. But if you take a picture of a molecular chaos, which is a microscopic little piece of a gas with all the um, molecules bouncing around, if you run it forwards, it looks the same as if you run it backwards. Microphysics has the problem that it's time reversible, whereas macroscopic physics doesn't look time reversible. And this is a problem that Prigogine was telling the physical world requires new principles, and everyone said he's crazy. Okay, but the problem is he didn't have a, a, a good answer. You know, it's not enough to say that current physics is wrong, as Feynman said. You have to suggest something better, and that's that's harder to do. So, so what Fredkin and his collaborators did was they found a cellular automata toy world which is time reversible, and they even managed to get a computation done. They managed to embed a computer into this toy world. And the interesting thing about this computation, this is related to work of Charles Bennett also in reversible computation, is if you run it backwards, it, 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 re, it recreates the, uh, the original state of the system. And you can do computing that way. So, you know, speaking in terms of, um, 
of uh, crazy ideas from the Middle Ages, uh, like Leibniz might have, you know, if people think the soul is immortal, well, in a cellular automata world which is reversible, no information is really ever lost. Because you can always run the system backwards and get back to the initial state. Of course, that doesn't help you much after you're dead, you know. But, but, but in some sense, you're still there if it's a cellular automata reversible world. Now, my friends like Charles Bennett, who's one of the leaders in quantum computing and quantum computation and quantum information theory, he says Fredkin is wrong. You, reversibility is enough. You need to put quantum mechanics into a cellular automata to get something realistic. Um, and, of course, Fredkin doesn't want to. I don't care. What I would like to have in a toy universe, so I call this theoretical theoretical physics. Normal theoretical physics is about this world. Theoretical theoretical physics is about an interesting world that maybe isn't this world, probably isn't this world. So I don't care. What I would like a theoretical theoretical physics to do is, first of all, have digital physics, which means finite amount of information, no real numbers, and be able to have living organisms in it. Ideally, I would like to set up the rules for a world and be able to prove that life has to evolve and it should be more intelligent than I am. Because if you just put in something into a toy world, that's easy. What's more difficult is to get something more out than you put in. Right? Now, I don't know how to do this. Okay? So we've been going at a gallop through these ideas and now let me get to the mathematical part against real numbers. So there are some reasons to want to avoid real numbers, to have a complete physical theory where you assume you know all the laws of physics and the complete state of a physical system is a finite amount of bits. And there are some even arguments in current physics that this might be the case. How about some mathematical arguments against real numbers? Well, there are lots of them, actually. It's just that the people who think about it tend to ruin their careers, like I may be doing at the moment. Let me tell you one argument against real numbers. There is a number called Borel's number. Borel wrote a paper in 1927. No? Borel wrote a paper in 1927 where he imagined a real number where the nth bit or the nth digit answers the nth possible question, this is no good, in French. You know, there's no problem with putting an infinite amount of information into a real number because you have an infinite number of digits. So Borel said in, oops, in 1927, Borel said in 1927 about this number, nth digit answers nth question in French. So what you do is all possible questions in French, if you freeze the French language and don't change the grammar and don't let it evolve, like really happens, then all possible texts from the French alphabet are countable or denumerable, right? So you, there's an nth text. Most of the texts are garbage. Uh, because they're not grammatical or they're not French. Maybe you can filter out only the grammatical ones, but it doesn't matter. You can just put all possible texts from the French alphabet, number them, and the nth digit of Borel's number answers the nth yes-no question. Now, maybe you can have, uh, you know, uh, zero mean it's not valid French, right? And then the next thing would be one might mean um, it's not a yes-no question. Most texts in French which are valid French, you know, they may be novels, love letters, uh, they're not going to be yes-no questions. And two might mean it's a yes-no question, but maybe it doesn't have an answer. You know, for example, is the answer to this question no? I think whatever you answer yes or no, it's wrong. So, and then three and four would mean it's a valid yes-no question in French and the answer is yes, and four would mean it's a valid yes-no question and the answer is no. I don't think Borel, you know, did this much detail. He just, so then Borel looked at this number and, you know, Borel had a sort of a constructive attitude. You know, he didn't have a theological attitude to math. He looks at this number and he says, why should I believe 